thank you very much for the gracious opportunity. I see friendly faces that I've known. I know some people from uh, Tucson a long time ago when I got some of my feet wet doing uh, ridiculously, stupidly large things that they never teach you about in graduate school. Um, I'm going to talk about from small beginnings come greater goods and talk about the notion of applied things that could actually change the direction and valence and well-being of our children and our adults in this society. Unfortunately, I won't be able necessarily to be able to cure, for example, the speech of the people in Congress so that they're able to talk politely in a way, in a language that other people could hear. But if I could do that, please nominate me for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I am a scientist. My declaration here is I own a private company. I try to make money whenever I can. <laughs> MasterCard, Visa, and American Express accepted. Thank you very much. So, and we do programs. Uh, I'm sort of either blessed or cursed. I counted them up the other day. That I've done 12 population level trials. And that's a lot. And you, I have a lot of skin knees, and I have some hard-won lessons to learn that I'd like to impart with you very briefly in the course of about 45 minutes, and I better start that. So I'm going to talk about some fundamental units of behavioral change. I'm very interested in finding small things that make a difference, because the truth is it's only small things that make a difference. Otherwise, nothing would be happening in the world because big things are ridiculously hard to do. Just try to implement national health care in the United States <laughs> as an example. And I got interested in this because of my studies at the University of Kansas. I was very, very fortunate that uh, Don Baer was my, uh, advise, my dissertation advisor and Todd Risley and Mont Rose Wolf were on my committee, uh, along with Jim Sherman and John Wright, because I was also interested in media, which is how I became involved in a very large project with Sesame Street to, te to test the first um, experimentally well, really, to test a way to prevent pedestrian accidents to young children, which was the third leading cause of death in the United States. And can you imagine you're looking for a dissertation topic that no one has ever done an experimental study that was successful in, and that it's a big deal, and the prior experimental study resulted in more children dying. So one of the first things to remember if you're going to do anything large is remember you have the possibility of harm, and you need to measure adverse effects. I never do a study without trying to measure for the possibility of adverse effects. Don't believe that you're going to cure cancer without killing a few people as a possibility. So you got to do that. So I'm going to talk about a testable approach for improving speech, language, and hearing outcomes at a population level. My very earliest work in graduate school was in the Infant de Development Laboratory where uh, Frances Deegan Horowitz and her students did all of that work that showed that babies were smart. The doctors didn't think so, but we saw the babies and they were. Now, we don't need another Silicon Valley. We need a carbon-based valley. We need a valley of enterprising people who are going to think about solving our carbon-based problems. We are not made of silicon. We are made of carbon, and all life forms exist on carbon. And we have a periodic table, and people talk about that. So our iPhones and iPads and computers run on silicon and a whole bunch of other heavy elements and other things. But they don't run as a life form. We, however, are carbon-based and we run on carbon, each other. Now, what we have to do is begin to create a periodic table. From that periodic table, if you're a chemist, or an engineer or something, you can create an amazing array of things. But you actually know the properties of each one of those components, how they work in the world, and then we begin to learn how to put them together to make something that's completely novel that has never happened before in the universe. That's a pretty cool thing, but we need to think about that also in the context of speech, 
language and hearing. What are the fundamental units that we're manipulating? Do we have a science for fundamental units? I mean, I think back of Todd Risley's study and Betty Hart's study of the meaningful differences. That is the most amazing study in the world. Microcoding of all of those interactions in the PD-11 uh, PD computer that that was done on was on the reverse side of my office, and I could hear that damn thing operate all of the time. And we had a, a 10 megabyte hard drive that was the size of a telephone booth. <laughs> that was a big deal, and it happened. So I'm arguing today for creating that periodic table for our work of um, simplicity. Now, the Meaningful Differences study has a 1,485 citations. Does anyone here have an article that's got 14? about 100 citations. You know, that puts you in a world-class level, okay? That's pretty damn good. One of the most influential studies, yet we have failed to convert that into a population-level practice to make meaningful differences at a large scale to improve the speech, hearing, and language of young children. Charlie Greenwood has developed a little app. I think it works now on, or could potentially work on a phone, and it can code the same kinds of things that we had all of those observers that went out in the Meaningful Differences study. But we've not used that particularly. For example, there could be an app that was giving feedback to families about their meaningful differences in language composition. That's a possibility to use silicon to change carbon life forms. Now, I'd like each of you to reflect on your own knowledge. We have 130 people, I believe, or 120 people. Is that right, Leslie? Nancy? Okay. So, each of you has a vast storehouse of knowledge. I know Rob does. Pam's got some. And other people have got some pretty amazing units of knowledge about changing human behavior related to speech and language and hearing. I'd like you to think about that. Think about the simplest practice that you know, something that could be taught to many people. I want you to bring that to your prefrontal cortex and hold it there. And I'd like for you to think about take a piece of paper, because this is the beginning of creating that periodic table. Not everything we write today might convert that, but some of them will. And some of those will become powerful golden ore pieces that could help change things. So write the name of the strategy that you can think of in your mind that's relatively simple, that improves speech, language, or hearing. Very simple practice. Write the name of that. And then write down, what do you think it increases? What would be the observable thing that you could count, either frequency or duration or intensity, that it increased in speech, language, or hearing? As you're thinking about that, also think about what it might decrease, what that simple strategy might decrease in frequency, duration, or intensity. Now, one of the things I've learned in doing 12 large-scale projects is always measure both the increase and the decrease. <laughs> always do that. They are not seesaws. We proved that in our Peace Builders study. I thought just because we increased prosocial behavior by 0.7 effect size it, with only four hours of in-service training, I'd see almost the same reciprocal in disturbing disruptive behavior. No. Children could be, have prosocial behavior and be little <laughs> at the same time. What a novel concept. <laughs> so, what it would increase, what it could decrease. How many people could benefit by that strategy potentially in North America? How many people could potentially 
benefit by this strategy in North America across all ages, whatever you think those age categories are. That is what we would like to reach as the population number. Not necessarily that we're going to get there. And what's a good reference for the strategy? Just, you know, one simple reference that comes to mind. So if you ask me, you know, what was this absolute reference that I would tell people they need to know about the uh, good behavior game? I'd say Barish, uh, Saunders, and Wolf, 1969, in Java. In How difficult is it to learn to use in time, skill, or other? There might be mechanical or physical resources that are required. The strategy might be very simple, but perhaps it costs uh, $1,000 to buy the equipment to do it. So how difficult is it to learn in time, skill, or other? And here's a really important question. Can it be evaluated in a single subject design? Can it be evaluated in a multiple baseline, a reversal, a multi-probe design? There are many possible variations. Here's why I'm asking that. Never, ever, ever, under any circumstances whatsoever, undertake a randomized control group trial unless you have done some really good single subject designs and you know the sources of variability. Do, because otherwise, the variability in your RCT will kill you and eat you alive. Because you didn't know where the sources of variability are coming from. And even if you've done some single subject designs, be prepared, surprise, because you'll find out new ones as you go along. Then the next thing is, write your name and email on that piece of paper, and later today, give that to our organizers, because that's going to become the sort of moving library of developing the strategies that we could take to scale. There will be others, and I hope that you will nominate other ideas. But having those simple ideas, rather than a big strategy, because I'm going to suggest that we would, once we have identified those small units of change in the periodic table, now we are beginning to have a technology, a replicable technology that could be brought to scale. And the things that you are writing about on that list are not theories. They may involve a theory, but it is not a theory. It is a thing that you could hold in your hand and learn to do. If you said psychoanalysis, I'd go, that's a great, interesting book to read. But show me how I can use that with a kid today. So. Um, Tony Biglin and I and Brian Flay uh, and Erwin Sandler f had a paper published in the American Psychologist called uh, The Critical Role of Nurturing Environments in Human Development. And that was one of those life bucket list things to get, you know, it's an article in the American Psychologist. And I knew it was coming out, and just one day I went out in my mailbox and opened up, oh, there's an, oh my God, it's the first article, wow! Score one, Dennis. Um, so, we propose that there are four things that are categorical to help us frame what we might need to do to make changes. One is to create a nurturing environment. And does language and speech and hearing acquisition require a nurturing environment? What did we learn from the Meaningful Differences study? Hell yes, it requires a nurturing environment. And it's a huge effect from very tiny things. So for instance, their study shows that the kids who are doing well are richly reinforced for positive behavior and their language acquisitions. We have to limit exposure to problematic behavior. Rob over here is pretty much, you're involved in a lot of that in trying to reduce problematic behavior in schools. 
because we know that that problematic behavior is basically contagious. And the other reason we know that it's contagious is what is the principal predator of humans since the invention of stone tools? Other humans. And <laughs> what is the principal source of safety for said humans since the invention of stone tools? Other humans with other stone tools. <laughs> So understanding the evolutionary dynamics that we are operating in human systems. Humans are the only species that are both eusocial and predatory of each other at the same time. That's a very interesting complexity. So limiting the problem exposure to problematic behaviors, so in meaningful differences, we see that by uh, the issue of folks, all of the negative imperatives, stop that, don't do that, those kinds of things that have sort of catastrophic effects on children's development in increasing oppositional defiance and conduct disorders. And by the way, most uh, mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders are not disorders. They are evolutionary adaptations to when human society goes nuts. That's an important thing to remember. And now reduce toxic influences. So toxic influences can be social and they can be biological. Uh, one of the things is a lot of us were trained, I mean, I'm trained in behavior analysis, obviously, and, you know, we were not, not supposed to touch those physiological things, you know. You're just like, those are bad, don't talk about those things. You can't do that! Can't ignore a whole branch of science. So now we're interested, for example, in uh, how, what are some of the causes of the rising levels of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders, which include learning disabilities. For instance, there's been a, has anyone noticed that we've had a major dietary shift in America? Okay. You may or may not know that one of the most significant dietary shifts that's accounting for mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders is the change in the omega-6 and omega-3 ratio in consumption even during uh, pregnancy. So if a woman, for example, consumes low levels of omega-3 fatty acid during pregnancy, i.e. fish, oily fish, uh, she uh, will likely, 32% uh, of those women's children by age eight will have developmental disorders, 15, 32%. Now, if they eat oily fish, only 15% will have developmental disorders by age uh, eight. That's in a huge study, the ALSPAC study in the United Kingdom funded by the National Institutes of Health. Now, so we have to pay attention to those kinds of things. And once you understand the physiology of omega-6 and omega-3, its linkages, how it affects human behavior, the acquisition of behavior, the reinforcement system, all of those things begin to make sense. And then when you look at it in evolutionary and anthropological things, then you begin to understand why some of those things were selected by humans. So for instance, one of the things we know that autism spectrum, is, is autism spectrum disorder increasing in this country? Yes, it appears to be, okay? So, I mean, the first time people started talking about it, I only had one kid with autism spectrum disorder at the University of Kansas, and we got all those kids across the state because we were the sort of tertiary place. So I only had one. Well, I learned, for example, that vitamin D deficiency helps predict the rise in autism spectrum disorder, which varies by latitude and varies by skin color and diet. A whole bunch of very interesting things can vary in there. Now, all, we also have to increase psychological flexibility. Psychological flexibility, this is the work of Stephen Hayes, who's really great work on relational frame theory. Now, I do recommend that if you try to read that book, put it beside your bedside, because if you suffer from insomnia, it will cure it without any adverse effects. <laughs> it's very heavy reading, but important. Um, Psychological flexibility is necessary for us to adopt and use new practices, for us to, to be able to open ourselves up to a new theoretical construct. Just because I was trained in behavior analysis doesn't mean that I should be blind to anthropological things or findings in medicine. I better be smart about these things. Um, now, uh, we also, Tony and I wrote a paper in 2008 called Evidence-Based Kernels, Fundamental Units of Behavioral Influence. Because I'd written several papers before, I'd gotten in an argument with Rico Catalano. Does anybody here know Rico Catalano? Okay, great. So 
we were arguing it at this thing Tony had set up, and I, I, were say, I was saying that, you know, when I get a medicine, it has the label on it for the active ingredients. So in our prevention science and treatment science and intervention science, we ought to be listing the active ingredients and the inert ingredients, because there's a lot of inert stuff in things. And Rico said, no, 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 because people will start to roll their own. And I said, that's a good idea. You know, this is California. <laughs> so um, we started arguing, and then uh, we one of the things I asked him, they were doing a um, comprehensive school reform study, and so were we. And I asked him, I said, what's the first thing you teach teachers? You know, what's the first practical thing after you get done with the theory? Uh, oh, we teach them a universal signal for quiet. We have them put up the peace sign, and they use a chime or a bell or something like that. I said, huh, that's funny. We use the same thing except a harmonica. Why do you do that? Well, if you can't get the children's attention and change transition times, it doesn't matter what all the rest of the stuff is. If you do this properly, you get approximately 144 more hours for meaningful responding in the classroom and teaching. So thinking about kernels came out of that. So antecedent kernel, that would be one of them. Relational frame kernels, for example, for those of you who are familiar with our work in peace builders, uh, for example, we gave the kids uh, what's called an Emmanuel, an I am statement. I am a peace builder. I praise people. I give up put downs. I seek wise people as advisors and friends. I notice and speak up about hurts. I right wrongs. I offer help. I promise to build peace at home and school and community each day. Very powerful when you have that kind of relational frame of identity because people start to reinforce it in each other. Um, uh, and then physiological kernels we've talked about. So if you grow those things, now, an evidence-based kernel is the smallest scientifically proven unit of behavioral influence. It's indivisible. If I take away the harmonica, it doesn't work nearly as well. If I take away the lanyard, it doesn't work as well because I'll be leaving the harmonica over here and over there, and I'm here. So I lose time. And the lanyard makes sure that it's around my neck to remember it. The sound is soothing because children often with developmental disorders, if you use a chime or a, a bell, the high frequency sound just causes the alert circuitries in the brain, the P3 and P300 leads, to register nuclear attack at 12 o'clock. And they go. So it produces quick and easily measured change that can grow bigger change over time. Think about when you're doing something. If you're saying, if we're doing a, an intervention and it's going to take six months to see any measurable change, you better rethink it. Because you should be able to see micro measurable changes in days or weeks, maybe even minutes. Because that's how nature works. Now, that can grow and then can be used or alone or combined with other kernels to create new programs or strategy. In most of the active ingredients, if you look at the list of the National Registry of Effective Programs and Practices on NRAP, most all of the ones with the highest level of effect size have, uh, if you go back and read their bibliography, they have essentially evidence-based kernels that were all tested in single subject design. So they have lots of active ingredients that are easily noted. Now, they can be effective at a public health or population level, even spread by media or word of mouth, and they can help heal or reduce historic disparities. So people, I go to these damn adverse childhood experiences things. How many of you have been to one of those things? You all heard about adverse childhood experiences, the Kaiser Permanente study? Well, just go sit through a day of that. You want to slit your wrists. <laughs> and they say, you know, we need, you know, and, and then people sort of forget. They keep running, well, we want to do that over the Title I schools. And they said, you need to remember that was done in middle class working people in, in Kaiser Permanente. So this is middle, you know, this is everywhere. <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's like a disease and trauma informed treatment means we're just going to be, you know, we're going to have ACE special ambulances every day running to pick up people. So we better start thinking about trauma informed prevention. So we've got to think about those disparities. Now in our paper we uh, stopped at 52. 
We realized there were more, but it was really cute because we essentially had four suites and 52 cards, and you can rearrange them, and you can make almost anything with those 52 cards. But I know there are more, and I hope that you will contribute to the foundational knowledge at, that could be stored and grow here in the foundation so that we would have a toolbox that could be shared to scaffold and build new interventions. Now, um, the ivory tower has been used to designate the world or atmosphere where intellectuals engage in pursuits that are disconnected from practical concerns of everyday life. People ask me, are you in a university? I said, no, I can't stand departmental meetings. It's being bitten to death by ducks. <laughs> Uh, and I recently had one of those experiences. I am a co-investigator at Johns Hopkins, and we had a meeting about doing a nutritional, a foundation wanted to do nutritional supplements in um, uh, Baltimore schools, and I do a lot of work in Baltimore schools, and so I brought Joe Heblin, who is the leading scientist on, uh, he's the chief of the molecular membrane laboratory and the nutritional laboratory at National Institutes of Health. He's a smart dude. And Adrian Rain, if anybody knows him, he's another super smart dude. And uh, those people talked, and we were being bitten to death by ducks, which is why I would, they, well, the children in Baltimore should get their omega-3 uh, from wild salmon. <laughs> and I'm going, have you been to a school cafeteria in Baltimore? <laughs> uh, they get, and have you seen the bodegas where they get their breakfast? You know, it's essentially deep fat fried uh, tweet hostess Twinkies. So. We need to bridge, we need to visit the other archipelagos of the Ivory Tower, the other little islands, as uh, David Sloan Wilson refers to them. Uh, he wanted to do all this prevention thing, and he didn't know anything about prevention science, met Tony Biglin, and then uh, the rest is history. So uh, we are, you know, resistance is futile. So now planting and growing your evidence-based kernels. Once you have an idea that something small like this might work, okay, could you combine it? with other things. So for example, could you combine this with another kernel called beat the timer and another kernel called the PREMAC principle? How many have heard of the PREMAC principle? Okay, oh, it's a delicious thing in schools. You know, you can, we have over 500 prizes based on uh, the PREMAC principle for rewards in schools. Don't have to use stickers, don't have to use stamps. But for example, in first grade, uh, we might draw out of the jar, and it's a mystery motivator, so you don't know what it is in the box, and that makes the dopamine circuitry go absolutely wild, anticipating. It's based on the principle of gambling. So in first grade, <laughs> and you know, there's whole industries on that thing. Okay, so we have, let me introduce you to a Granny Swaki prize that you can use. Please stand, because you've been sitting for about 45 minutes or an hour. Howard, come on out. You're going to be my partner, okay? So I'm going to show you a Granny's Wacky Prize, a simple thing. So you guys have just done something that earned the teacher's recognition. You have been working your butts off for like 45 minutes and have been completely paying attention to the guest lecturer, Dr. Embry. So as a special thanks, we're going to have Granny's Wacky Prize. Shake the box. Oh, my God. The, Oli the amazing Olympic race. So here's how we do it. I will call, I will blow my harmonica for start, okay? And with your partner, you start to run the race. It'll be 10 second prize. Midway, we start, we have to get faster and faster. And when we go across the finish line, that's the harmonica, we jump up and give each other a high five. <laughs> All right, you ready? Get set, go. <laughs> All right, a little faster, come on, we're gonna get there. Oh, we're almost there, we're there, yes! Oh, yay! <laughs> you did say for us to, um, for me to make it fun, so I did. <laughs> that was cool, right? By the way, that also has a physiological effect on you. Okay, so uh, uh, Joe, uh, 
Joseph Donnelly at the University of Kansas has done this amazing study showing that interspersing the day with these brief physical activities uh, not only increase, de decreases BMI, it's the only school-based thing to decrease BMI, but it also, what do you think it does to academics? Improves academics. Why? Well, it changes the brain chemistry. That's the largest, that is the place where people are most um, sedated, if you will, sedentary, in their daily lives as kids. And movement creates brain-derived neurofactor. Without brain-derived neurofactor, you can't learn a damn thing because the operant stuff won't wire. You need, I tell people, the teachers, BDNF, brain-derived neurofactor, is essentially brain fertilizer. And, it follow, and with brain fertilizer, you can uh, do Hebe's law. Neurons that fire together, wire together, okay? So, now, they can be developed in um, single subject designs that have easily perceived and measured proximal gains and has robust reliability when implemented versus uh, depending on tight dose and fidelity. How easy would it be to implement something like a little box? with those kind of prizes. Super easy. And who's going to come up with ideas for it? The kids. So you're going to have an infinite supply of ideas for it. And by giving it a cute name, and if I called it the Premac Principle, <laughs> just doesn't have good mouthfeel. So, you know, making it, giving it a cute name. Always thinking about the relational frames and the marketing of your tools. Never name your tools after the problem you're trying to prevent. <laughs> this is a serious mistake by most people in designing programs. Now, it must be, you know, and the robust reliability is really, really good. Does it matter, for example, if the Granny Swacky Prizes are in a box? No, could they be in a bag? Okay, could they be in a jar? Could they be in a leftover Halloween treat kit? Yes. Do they have to be on slips of paper? No, you could maybe even put it up on the smart board and have a thing. So there's lots, that's robust implementation rather than rigid dose infidelity. Um, they have to be consilient with multiple theoretical perspectives. This is why I hate departmental meetings. <laughs> my, my micro theory is a slightly bigger than your micro theory. <laughs> and you know, we're measuring now things, we, the, the size in nanometers rather than yards or miles or kilometers. I want to measure big things in time, but the small things do make a difference, but you've got to connect the things and do the crosswalk. So how many do you think, for example, in explaining to teachers that Granny's Wacky Prizes is based on the PREMAC principle, that's good, but what really hooks them? When I link it up to brain science. And you know, I got my medical people. I was like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to test that. By the way, could I come and use some of your scanners? I'd really like to do that. <laughs> so now, can it, and can it grow symbiotically with other strategies? Can we marry them? So for example, since the kids have just given us, you know, we have another two, uh, we made, we, by the way, the transitions go from two to five minutes apiece down to about 10 seconds apiece. I can show you videos of that. And there are 50 transitions in the course of a day in an average elementary school. They normally last those two to five minutes, so that's at least 100 minutes a day of no opportunity to, well, there is opportunity to respond, but the responses are none of the things that we want in this room. They interfere with all of those things. But can they grow symbiotically? So we've, we can pair this with Granny's Wacky Prizes. Kids, you've saved us so much time, you know, let's have a little bit of fun. So we're now rewarding effort, and we've used two things very simply to scaffold something. They can uh, fit into selection by consequences. In the recent paper that we have in Brain and Behavioral Science, we talk about selection by consequences as a major conceptual 
meta theory. So Hebe's law, neurons that fire together, is selection by consequences. The Granny Swacky prize is selection by consequences. I'm going to show you a state level interrupted time series design that uses selection by consequences to reduce tobacco use in minors. So the, that's a scalable thing. And of course, the amount of money that you receive in research grants in promotion and tenure is selection by consequences. <laughs> so you'll be able to come up with other things. Some kernels in combination or kernels are used often and may improve the indicators of well-being reduce morbidity and possibly mortality. You know, that's a fr now we use a phrase for when some of these things are used a lot. They're not programs. This is not a program. So I struggled to figure out a naming for things that were naturally occurring. What Todd and Betty observed with meaningful differences was not a program. Perhaps it was programmed by evolution, but not a program. You know, open your manual to page 101 and read the instructions there. It wasn't like that. So what are things that might be protective that you use on a daily basis? And the paper uh, posits one of the first ones the analogy we give, how, how many people here have had a baby? How many people here were a baby at some point? <laughs> okay, you owe your life to Ignatius Semmelweis. In 1840, uh, he had three maternity wards. And he noticed that uh, the wards that were maintained by the physicians had very high maternal and uh, morbidity, about 26% of the moms died in childbed fever. But he noticed that the maternity wards tended by uh, uh, midwives didn't. They had only about a 1%. But he noticed that they always washed everything. So he undertook a little experiment. He used a tincture of chlorine, which we, you can buy as a product at uh, Target and Walmart and grocery store. That's called bleach, Clorox. Okay. So we did this in an interrupted time series design <laughs> across three maternity awards. First maternity award, he does it with the uh, tincture of chlorine. <laughs> mortality, morta uh, mortality drops down to 1%, stays that way. No change in the other two maternity awards. He decides to try a different variation, so he tries a uh, tincture of carbolic acid, which has the same properties of being an antiseptic. They didn't know about germs in, whack, down, and then he does the next one. He presents all of this to the Viennese Medical Society, and they promptly have him put in a mental institution. Because it's Eve's curse that women die in childbirth. Do you hear the psychological inflexibility? <laughs> Of course it was true, and it wasn't the only, there were other people who had replicated this same phenomenon, but they didn't have the internet then. It took 40 years for this to become common practice. That, in my paper, I argue, is the first experimentally tested behavioral vaccine. You use seat belts, you brush your teeth, you put the gates across the stairwell for your babies, the electric, the little plug sockety things, those are behavioral vaccines. Things who repeated daily use uh, reduce the risk of mortality and morbidity and or increase well-being. So a lot of what we do in speech and language and hearing are not programs. They are essentially behavioral vaccines made up of kernels used every day. It's important for us to change our thinking from programs to explain these things as something that you do every day. Because, <laughs> will a child, if they have a 10-hour program in speech and language and thing, be changed for life? Probably not. It might have an improvement, but you got to repeat. You know, I can't just brush my teeth once or wear my seatbelt once. It's an everyday thing to do these things. So 
Now, here's an example of an evidence-based kernel recipe as a behavioral vaccine. We have a relational frame. In Wyoming, in Wisconsin, we do the right thing by not selling tobacco to minors. That is the language of promotion. Uh, we have mystery shoppers, which is an evidence-based kernel. The mystery shoppers go to the store, and do mystery shoppers look for the good or the bad? They look for the good. Because if you've done the right thing, you get some kind of, maybe not a granny swacky prize, but you get a gift certificate and an attaboy and an attagirl kind of thing. So the mystery shoppers went out and reinforced the clerk and the store, and they did it on public posting. So we had a scoreboard every day for every single county in Wisconsin. And those were announced on the, on the radio station. So the kids who did the mystery shopping, let's say they were in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and they, got, and they called the morning AM show. You know, every community has a morning AM talk show. And so they call up and, hi, this is the Wisconsin uh, youth team, and we're out at uh, Bill's Bait Shop at Ake Nogi. And we just want to tell you that Bill's Bait Shop did the right thing by not selling tobacco to us miners, and they're helping our youth be healthier, 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 <laughs> healthier, and happier for their whole lives. So ring that bell on your radio show. Ding, ding, dong, you know, the cowbell rings. And we gave out cards to all the elected officials who, that with their names printed on it that they could give to the managers of the stores or the clerks, thanking them for doing the right thing. And they said, well, how do you know if they're doing the right thing? I said, we've gotten the rate down to less than 5% of the time that they're selling tobacco. So you're going to be rewarding most of the people in the poor schmuck who gets the card from you that's sold is going to be reminded, oh, this is the community norm. Hmm. So what did that do? We, this was a study done by, originally by Tony Biglin, and it's a small-scale study. And we did this across two whole states, and here's the rapid thing. So Wisconsin, Wyoming had 60% of the time the kids could buy tobacco. In 45 days, we brought that down to less than 10% of the time. Uh, that saved, by the way, $3 million in penalties. In Wisconsin, they were at 37% of the time the kids could buy it. We had a shorter period of time, and Wisconsin was 10 times larger and 70 counties, and we only had 40% of the counties. Initially, we brought it down under the threshold, and eventually it went down to less than 2%. And using the Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, that the CDC ran in both states, we were able to reduce uh, any 30-day use of tobacco substantially by trajectory, and everyday use in Wyoming substantially. This was confounded in Wisconsin because they increased the tax on tobacco the year we, uh, we just did that. But it didn't seem, it may have had an effect here, but notice it didn't affect experimentation. The tax did not affect experimentation, which is what you would have predicted. Now, here's a logic model that we've created for doing things to scale that begin with small kernels. So once you know these kinds of things and you've identified the behavior that you want to increase and the behaviors you want to decrease, then you have to predict the benefits that are going to happen in a population. Nobody's going to buy your thing unless you tell them how it's going to scratch their back. And scratching their back may be time, money, whatever. But you don't go telling them necessarily how you're going to solve the problem in, you know, in the universe. You've got to tell them how it's going to help Brian or Brian's organization. And then what you have to do is create the policy and advocacy supports to nurture that. You have to develop a business plan. Oh my god. They don't teach you that in graduate school. But it must have an operational business plan besides getting another grant. <laughs> and cultivate early adopters for local impact data and testimonials. If you don't have the testimonials, you will not be able to close the deal. And just because somebody in Los Angeles said it was a good thing is not going to persuade the cabinet in Manitoba that it's a good thing. I got to drag up some bodies from Manitoba that are going to say it's the best thing since sliced bread. And you got to cite re relevant endorsement standards because people say, well, how does this fit into Common Core? I call that Common Gore, actually. <laughs> and cite powerful studies and links to existing cultural anthropological practices so that people can go, oh yeah, we sort of do that. Yeah, we're just going to tweak that a bit. It's a shaping thing. Oh, yep, I got to come to my stop. I'm almost there. So 
Um, create, and then create a population level plan. I'll just briefly go through that. Create a public scoreboard. You have to have a social marketing component here. There are actually five components of a social marketing thing. There's population level targeting. So you have to also think about when you're doing a bigger thing, how do you ramp it up and down? Because if you're doing a universal, you're going to have to have some adaptations for higher intensities because not everybody's going to work in that thing and just don't leave it to chance. You need to have reinforcement and recognition systems, and you have to re have a monitoring system that is providing real-time feedback. Think back to the applied behavior analysis studies. So there's a re-aim thing that stands for reach. You have to reach a large number of people, at least 20%, and you have to have efficacious thing that really works. You have to get a fair number of people to adopt it. They have to implement it and maintain and the measurement of it. Those are the uh, formula for these things. Just briefly, this is one of those things. This is the most cited, uh, one of the most cited studies in behavior analysis. It's a, a citation classic. It's the good behavior game. Thousands of citations for it. It went unused at a population level. It was invented by a teacher. So Johns Hopkins did longitudinal studies on this. After it was well established, there were 20 interrupted time series studies before the longitudinal study. So we really knew it worked. It's a random assignment. They only got it for one year. No more GBG. Those kids have been followed through age 19 and 21, 26 and 30. And there are now five independent replications of the longitudinal study. And it has dramatic effects. You can see that on NRAP. We've been able to show that you can take it to scale. This is 186 teachers in three months in eight diverse school districts across the United States that were selected by the federal government and said, go do your stuff. <laughs> I almost said, your thing. OK. So you have to show to the, the payor that you can rapidly deploy that. Now, what does this do for America? Because we have this health care problem. You mentioned it, all of these costs, all of these things that are rising. So we have cost estimates from the uh, Washington State Institute for Public Policy. So we've translated their gobbledygeek into something that people can understand. So this is what it would do if every first grader, we have about 4 million first graders every year, what it would do at age 21. We have now computed that for every single congressional district. Why? Because that's where policy gets made. For every state, and you can compute it for every school district. And so we have to start thinking about putting our numbers like that. We've also done an analysis and added to the good behavior game to make it survivable in the real world. Because I can tell you, when I first did my first replication of it, it was a complete, utter, miserable failure and did not work because the people said, I ain't touching that thing. So you also have to be prepared to do media and so on. You have to learn to market things. Don't depend on an advertising company to do it. You have to understand that. So next steps, we need to create and test those evidence-based kernels. Build that library. We need to move from small beginnings to greater goods, as St. Francis of Assisi did, said. And our real hero is Benjamin Franklin, who founded the Leather Apron Club. The Leather Apron Club was completely different than any other scientific institution in its existence at the time. They met every week, discussed things, and then set about creating a practical plan to test their ideas. All of the other science was affectation in Europe. The people who did the experiments or did the data collections were never the people who were writing about it, so they had no firsthand knowledge. So this, you know, they invented uh, the Franklin stove and other kinds of things which transformed America. In this country, we have the Ar American intellectual movement, which was unique, the transcendental movement, the logical positivism movement, which all of that science has created us in this room. So we have to go back to our roots and think about that practicality. We need to bridge our ivy archipelago we need to recognize that we're in new territory, for example, on epigenetics. How many of you had a course in that in graduate school? And that's the rage. We need to understand how we are actually changing that in our behavioral interventions. We have to move from our minor theory, our pet theory, you know, that the, that the Earth is the center of the solar system. Our little theory is the center of the science to the Big Bang. We need to consider the sheer joy 
the sheer joy of being able to do something great um, for speech, language, and hearing for our children's futures, for our futures. Thank you very much. Thank you for a yeah. wonderful talk and so wonderful that you could relate to our world so well. Thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Rogers. I'm the Chief Staff Officer for Science and Research at ASHA. And um, I really um, liked your kernel approach. I like that it was evidence-based kernels. And my question is, clearly at some point you leave the evidence-based trail and you mix kernels together. You probably don't have the time or money to test all those permutations. Right. What is the, the method to get from kernels to packages and feel like you're still walking the evidence-based walk? Am I getting a hug? Better yet. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm old-fashioned, dear. Well, okay. That's okay. It. it was yes. the same emotion. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I, I at least knew you weren't coming to punch me, so oh, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Okay, it's a great question. Yeah. So the answer is continuous measurement. Yeah. And so we, for example, with uh, PAX GBG, we have an operational measurement system that is measuring essentially engaged minutes, which is opportunity to respond. And we're measuring the rate of disturbing disruptive behaviors uh, per um, hour, actually. And it's a coarse one. But we use that as we do new permutations to keep looking at that. And so we have now, we've, we've done this in more than 650 schools, thousands of classrooms, all 38 states now, Canada, Ireland, Estonia, et cetera. So we use those data to look at them and we're very alert for problems. And then you kind of tweak the permutation and the first thing we look for is the rapid rate of adoption and then the sustainability. And the other thing that we've done, and I, and I uh, suggest you do this, is never go for large print runs. <laughs> Unless they're dirt cheap. Because you're going to wind up throwing away a whole bunch of paper. Uh, so that way you can make incremental improvements. So we use demand uh, digital printing for our manual. Now we've actually gone to offset because we've gotten it stable enough that it's pretty reliable. That doesn't mean that we don't want to make changes, but we're doing that very carefully. So continuing having your ongoing measurement system that's both for proximal outcomes and process outcomes. So we created a rubric to measure those kind of implementation factors and then monitor that. And then every now and then, we're also very attuned to spontaneous you know, innovations that people do. Some of them suck. Some of them, for example, are fantastic. Like one of them was a teacher when we were observing in Syracuse. Um, the, normally, the teachers announce, you know, what the disturbing disruptor, we call them spleems, that's a relational frame that controls his physiology. But the teacher asked the kids to predict what would be PACs, the good, and spleems before they played a game, and then asked them to debrief it. And as soon as I thought, oh my God, that's self-regulation right there, we're putting that in now. Why didn't I think about that? That's how. Hi. Yes. Uh, my name is Rebecca McCauley, and yes, I'm at please. Ohio State. And um, the question I have for you is that looking at interventions, there is a great deal of, of uh, reward to individual uh, clinician researchers to develop an intervention that has their stamp on it, that's associated yes. with them. Absolutely. And it may have, you know, I, having been involved in some projects that look at related interventions for a particular area, you see these common elements that I think could vie for status as a kernel. Yes. But how do you break down the, the tie that people have to their particular package? And this is something that I think you also have to deal with at the level of the individual clinician who may end up with their set of kernels that they're particularly tied to. And it may be that we're going to hear about this from the anthropological point of view, but it seems like a big issue for us. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, part of how you do that is that you really focus on the psychological flexibility things and pay attention to the work of Stephen Hayes in the adoption of innovation. So what you put people in contact with is their real core values of what they're trying to do. 
So when we're working, for example, with schools, we ask them, what, do you want to, what are the things that you want to increase and decrease? And what would you see, hear, feel, and do differently if those things happened? Then we ask them, what is it that you want to pack in your children's suitcases for life as they go away 20 years from now? What do you not want in those suitcases for life? And then we keep going back to those core values. And that helps people move through the difficulty of it's mine, 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 you know, in the Nemo um, <laughs> thing. And that's very helpful uh, in, yes? I think, sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, but I think at the level for that that is most helpful with individual clinicians, but that it's harder for researchers who have developed a set of studies to support the package that they yeah. have been associated with. Uh, uh, one of the, here's one of the dynamic problems I solved um, with that for myself, is I had a publisher, and my publisher was rigid because they had 10,000 copies in the warehouse, and I knew that the manual needed to be shredded. And so I, um, Whenever you do this, to give yourselves degrees of freedom, make sure that you never sign a tra copyright transfer that's forever. You only, if you do a publisher, may have a limited term so that you can renegotiate or kill them if you wish. I chose to kill them and start doing <laughs> it myself. And uh, the great thing was I had total control and I made a hell of a lot more money. And I was able to exercise my dedication to making the change and promoting the change. So I, I can't answer your question fully, but it's, yeah, it's a complicated one. Well, Go sure we'll yeah, OK. Go ahead. Uh, so my name is Tara McAllister Bion. I'm from New York University. Uh -huh. And uh, you probably noticed you got a real reaction out of the audience when you said, um, always do a single subject design before you move to an RCT. Yes. Uh, and I think you know a lot of us in the audience really love our single subject experimental designs. but. Um, most of us have also found that our grant reviewers don't really love them. And I was wondering if you had any tips on uh, getting that practice uh, through those levels of scrutiny for, from other fields that are not as positive about those methods. Well, I have contemplated the Khmer Rouge re-education camp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tony Biglin and I have been working on that with NIH. And for them, in their preliminary studies, to really encourage people to do single subject designs, we, we're making a little progress. A couple times when we put them in, we didn't get trashed. And um, so, and it, it helps, you know, if you also say, oh, yes, and we can actually convert these findings into an effect size. And there's literature on that. Most, most of the people in their who are the RTC folks have no knowledge of the statistical manipulations that are possible. And um, I think it's just also talk to the project officers before you submit to a particular uh, one. Um, but sometimes you can just go do it and use it as your preliminary study. It'll make your life, and you have a publication to cite. They'll never read the publication anyway, but you'll get your money more likely. I, don't, I didn't really answer your question as best I could, but we just have to keep pushing the envelope on that. And I think one of the things, and I did have a breakthrough on this, the Administration for uh, Children and Youth and the Assistant Secretary's Office for Research and Evaluation asked me to write a document with Lipsy on how to create programs when there were no programs. And so we talked, that paper really dwells out, and that's free online. I don't think we, did we put it in the package, the, the government one? Yeah, put the reference in. It's free online, and it does that. Great, thanks. Next, please. I was intrigued. My name is Amber Franklin. Hi, Amber. I'm from Miami University in Ohio. Uh -huh. um, and I was intrigued by your connection between Silicon Valley and Carbon Valley. And a lot of um, the way you packaged your presentation sounded like a business plan, how to market. Um, and when I think about Silicon Valley, I know one of the mantras was sort of fail big, fail often. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of uh, your notion of measuring adverse effects. So I was curious about in Carbon Valley, um, how does failure fit into innovation and, and answering the questions that we want to have answered? Uh, thank you. Um, by the way, our first 
venture into creating the Silicon Valley or a carbon-based valley is Wright State University. And we, we did a retreat for two days with them about this and we are now actually doing uh, this research now in pre-service training for both teachers and for human services people. But to answer your question, uh, I've had several big failures and they were terrible, they were catastrophic, I was completely ill, but damn they made me smarter um, in how to do things. And I think we need to um, present adverse findings as extremely helpful rather than to discard them. And you know, maybe we ought to have a finding of <laughs> fail small, fail big. Uh, here's the lessons learned uh, uh, from that. But you know, the first study on traffic safety was done by Sweden and they taught kids, uh, preschoolers to cross the street mid block think because somebody made the stupid error of believing police reports for what children did. The police people wrote down killed, killed, the kid killed crossing street mid block. No, if you went in direct observations, the kids never crossed the street, but they did enter the street in the course of play. And that was an essential uh, understanding then to design the intervention. But I think we need to sort of write that, and the foundation might be able to take that up as, uh, to do that. Yes, sir. This isn't a question, it's just a comment. Uh, John Miller, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh -huh. The foundation is the perfect place to submit, to fund that single subject work or other preliminary studies. And I just, it's obvious, but I thought I needed to say it. So, thank you. Thank you.